In this video, we'll focus on player flow and the macro layout design using flow path rings, the big picture, so to speak. We'll start with flow. When making multiplayer levels, good flow is very important. But what is flow? Good flow is the ability to move intuitively and smoothly through a level. Take this left example, for instance. Imagine this is an office space or a warehouse or something. A lot of these props, which could be chairs, tables, what have you, uh, are placed in such a way where players could easily get snagged and briefly stuck on them when they move through the space. There's a lot of very tight, narrower spaces where players might feel like they have to move more slowly or get stuck, things like that, especially when they need to move through quickly, like they're getting chased or something like that, which can get frustrating. Um, even just reading the space is harder because it's kind of like random, even though it might be realistically placed like in a real office setting, for instance, it, it can still result in the space feeling very harder to read and understand like where the invisible paths through the space are. And again, you can get snagged on stuff because moving through a game and moving through a real space in reality is quite different. On the other hand, if we just rearrange the props in a very basic example on the right here, you can see that the space become much more easier to read and uh, the gameplay opportunities present for the player, like getting cover, moving through here to not be seen, is way more apparent. There's also less risk of getting stuck on objects. So it results in a much more smooth uh, gameplay flow for the player. An example of something else that also results in bad multiplayer flow are dead ends. And it's not just limited to these kind of like uh, shorter dead ends, I guess, because the problem even gets worse when they're even longer. And the reason why they tend to be problematic in multiplayer games is that they tend to result in dead, so-called dead space, where there's no real gameplay purpose to go in here. And they tend to overcomplicate the layouts unnecessarily for no real benefit, especially when we're making kind of like a Counter-Strike or Valorant uh, map you don't want to add more so-called pointless complexity which don't really add anything and it's even worse if you don't have a, a map minimap or map in your game where players can easily see it but even if you do it can get confusing when someone runs through here and expect they can kind of like maybe run through and come out outside here but then when they run here but oh and then they kind of like just run into a dead end and then they have to be forced to turn around so it's generally better to cut them short like let's say for instance here like in the rightmost example because then they kind of offer what they own the benefit either either way because you can quickly dip in here and get cover from both sides um things like that which is a lot more beneficial in terms of flow something else that can result in poor multiplayer flow are sharp corners or u-turns um, as can be seen on this leftmost example here, uh, the problem with that is when a player enters through here, they don't actually see the path forward, so it can be confusing. So they might not uh, even know or notice that uh, it, there's a path forward until they move in here and turn around. And even if they knew about it, they would have to make a very sharp U-turn, which is generally even trickier if you play with a kind of like third-person character. Uh, on the right, we see a slightly better example. Because at least here, the player can see where the entry point is, but preferably you would even want to avoid having as sharp of a turn here by extending this wall a little bit further uh, to make the turn slightly smoother. And also you offer a bit more of a cover from this direction in case uh, some enemy is here or something like that. Uh, a good trick in general to check for good flow in your level is to sort of picture um, riding through a bike through your space and it should be feel generally comfortable like in terms of space and turns like imagine riding for a bike here you have to make an extremely sharp turn here which isn't ideal and also in terms of pathways generally two meters or something like that is generally comfortable to uh, quote unquote bike through so that's a good tip but flow also extends to the macro large scale layout design since you don't just need good flow for a single room but your entire level or map as a whole uh, but before we go into the guidelines we can use for this it's worth noting the difference between single player and multiplayer flow because it's not always clear for some players so i'd like to touch on that briefly first 
So in a single player game, having things like dead ends or things in the player's way might not only be fine, but even desirable. Like if the player is exploring some hidden temple, they might want to look around for hidden treasure, secret passageways, climb through rubble and such. However, in a multiplayer game, like say Valorant, generally the priority is not to have players getting lost or stuck, but lead them towards objectives and other players. So keep in mind that what could be good flow or design for single player might be bad for multiplayer and vice versa. So now that we know that good flow is important in a multiplayer level, a handy guideline to use are flow path rings. The idea of a flow path ring is to roughly make the main paths of your level be in the shape of a ring. The ring itself can be stretched and deformed so long as it creates uh, a loop, which is actually what we're after. So all of these are follow the same flow path ring structure. Uh, this forms the skeleton of your layout, which makes it easier to create connecting side paths and spaces while also maintaining a good flow. You can then add some connecting side paths in between these main paths, like so, or for instance, like so, uh, to create more complex layouts. This helps you avoid dead ends, makes the layout easier to orient yourself in, and creates a solid structure to build on. Connecting rings also leads to strategic show points. So, for instance, another ring could be connected like this, and you could have another side paths like so, uh, where the paths uh, intersect, which helps multiplayer levels play well. You will see some examples very short shortly on this. Just don't go overboard and overcomplicate your layout lay with too many rings or side paths. Your goal is to make it play well and not become too hard to navigate or find other players. Otherwise, using this kind of structure is uh, counterproductive, so to speak. So, to make things a bit easier to understand, let's look at some examples from existing games and see how the flow path ring structure applies. Shipment from Call of Duty is probably pretty easy to understand uh, visual example, so let's start with that. Here you can clearly see the main flow path ring loop here. We have these connecting side paths here and even have an additional side path here, which creates a very simple, nice flowing map. Another simple example along the lines of shipment is Castillo from Overwatch, where here we can see the main flow path here. Starts from here. There's the two team spawn points in these yellow buildings here. We also have an upper circular path here, as we can see here. And it extends to the courtyard here as well, where they also have a central statue. So there's generally several loops that all follow the general flow path ring structure and it also is made a bit more porous as you can see here with the entryways connecting sort of like the side paths. This type of flow path ring structure can also be seen in capture the flag type maps like Turbine from Team Fortress 2 where we can see there's basically two main flow path rings that connect in the middle along with an additional path in the center here. But if we look at some more complex examples, like let's say Dust2 from Counter-Strike, you can still see the general flow path structure. Like you have the first general outline around here that form the main loop. You then have several inner rings that form loops with additional side paths, which allows the uh, map to flow very smoothly despite its seemingly complex structure. And uh, yet another more complex example uh, we can take a look at is Ascent from Valorant, which again, we can see, despite looking fairly complex uh, on the surface, there's still the general flow path structure surrounding it, forming the loop, along with several smaller loops within, as we can see here, in addition to some connections in between here for some tactical advantages and so on. Another similar structure that still applies to flow path ring one is the atrium structure. This was more commonly seen in arena type shooters and boomer shooters. You can think of an atrium as a big room or space like a mini arena. This arena naturally doesn't need to be completely open and can have walls and such as 
in this very basic example. It's basically a pocketed space that forms a complete gameplay area. And to expand it, what they usually did was to connect them, preferably with more than two connections. So as a very basic example, you could maybe have that, and you can also extend it more by having more paths that uh, could, for instance, branch like that and connect like so, for instance. So you have a, maybe a smaller room here and uh, things along those lines. And to keep players moving, what is usually done is to place different power-ups and different weapons to help keep players moving and rotating and matching timings of like when the super health or big uh, double damage uh, power-up spawns. So just players continually flow through these uh, atrium spaces. Uh, just be mindful of the overall size and complexity of your layout. More atriums typically means that you should have less elevation in each atrium and just in general to not make it as overly complex and dense because players still need to run into each other and things like that. And a lot more of a slower pace the larger at atriums uh, are and the more of them you use. While uh, if you have a lower player count you generally need to stick to more of a maybe even a single atrium type of structure. The question of symmetry and asymmetry is something that will generally also come up during the layout stage of your multiplayer map or level. Um, symmetry is good when balance between multiple teams can become an issue. Like in a capture the flag type map like Turbine from Team Fortress 2 that we took a look at earlier, or this map here. It simply means that neither side will have a direct advantage over the other due to one side being easier to defend or attack from or something along those lines. This doesn't necessarily mean that both sides need to look the same though, since you could have a red and blue side, uh, be a cat or one other side be a castle and another be a wooden fort or things along those lines. A symmetry on the other hand is good when you want the level to feel and play more differently across the layout. This is usually for layouts that don't have a particular dedicated side for teams to both attack. So deathmatch, domination, bomb site, and similar type of modes are often asymmetric in terms of layouts. Worth keeping in mind that asymmetry increases the complexity for both you as a designer and for players, meaning you will need more time to iterate on the level and players can find learning the level to be harder. It can also mean that the time it takes for different teams to reach the same objective could be different since the distance or routes are different, so this is also worth keeping in mind. Asymmetry is still doable for something like a capture the flag map. It just becomes harder and more time consuming for you balance. Of course, symmetry and asymmetry are just general guidelines. You feel free to bend them where you feel it might be needed, meaning after your first symmetric layout pass, you can then slightly angle the layout on both sides, shift the buildings and similar adjustments to break the symmetry up a bit and make it feel a bit more natural. Nuketown from the Call of Duty series is a good example of this, where we can see that both buildings exist on roughly the same spots in the layout, but the buildings are different. The vehicles in the center are different, and to not have a straight rectangular shape, they angle both sides a bit to make it feel a bit more natural. Or in the case of an asymmetric map, you can make the key parts of your map more symmetric in nature to help balance it out a bit. So you still maintain an asymmetric map layout, but it's symmetric where it matters. I tend to ramble on a little bit with these videos, so I want to keep them short. So that's all for this time. Thank you for watching.